My topic today is transformer in action. So we've been working with transformer models for some time. And now we think uh, we are rolling out some first products in our first models in our products. And uh, I guess this is now, now good time to introduce, introduce what we learned and also some common experience, share some common experience. So to do so, we need to briefly visit what is our task, what kind of data we are working on, what kind of model, why we are doing this kind of stuff. So let's start from the beginning, short introduction about our company. So our company, OMQ, is a software company providing intelligent customer service software. So by intelligent customer service software, we mean you know, customer service is everywhere. So if you see only our customers, our customer companies, their domains, uh, quite uh, diverse, like e-commerce, public transport, universities, utility companies like electricity or gas, or service providers or internet service providers and so on, they all need to somehow communicate with customers. So if you see them, if you talk to them, then you will spot some common problem, common problem that is common within all those sectors. That is, customer support agents are most, the, one of the most boring job because they have to answer the same issues again and again and again to the people because you know common problems that's really common, 80, 20 uh, low they say. So what the OMQ spotted as our chance is that can we do it with uh, some uh, intelligent technology? Uh, again, I also don't really like AI term, but yeah, apply AI technology and can we do automatically answering these repeating parts away somehow automatically, that will help not only support agents, but also end customers too. Many of the big companies like public transport companies or e-commerce companies, e-commerce is better, but public transport companies, if you send an email, the response rate is something like three days or something mm -hmm. like that. So if you can save the time by some automat automatization, it is gain for everyone, right? So our vision, this is vision comment, uh, my boss here, Matthias, always says answer once. So what do you mean by answer once? It's, it's like this. You, as a human agent, answer a question only once. And the second then coming, you know, following time, the machine will follow up. So machine will answer instead. Okay, this is vision. We call it vision because it's on the horizon. We are trying to get there yet. Which means, yeah, the, the whole talk is about what we are trying to, what we are doing to trying to get there. So just as uh, give a concrete feeling, this is one of our product page uh, applied on uh, the Deutsche Bahn Koro bike, uh, bike rental service. This is one of the uh, product where you contact, uh, uh, contact form, web contact form. So you can contact by typing your message and then whole message will come up in the uh, Kunden service, customer service agent part as, as a new ticket. So why you are typing, you know, hello, I have a puncture in my front something something tire then you know, somehow or re relevant, uh, we, the relevant answer or relevant knowledge-based case that is already known is coming up on the right side. So if he or she click this one, be mailed ish eine Schaden am Fahrrad, how can I uh, register the damage of my uh, bike? Then this, this will lead to the already known answer, how you change your bike or how you get a refund or how you, you know, uh, things like that. If this information was helpful, then the guy or the, the lady wouldn't send this mail, so the agent will have less task to do, and also the customer will have faster you know, uh, gain on the knowledge he or she needs. This is one part of our product which we call as a, you know, the contact, OMQ contact. So our approach is something like knowledge-based centric method, that is, we collect uh, by humans and agents, the older known cases or common cases in central knowledge base where the cases are described and written in natural language. And then this knowledge base is looked up from various uh, products. For example, here uh, the contact case just we've seen. And here we also provide some kind of FAQ search where you, you know, self-service yourself, where typical queries would be like a few keywords, like you know, send a shipment cost to the uh, foreign country. But here we also have chatbot where it actually looks up the uh, knowledge base and uh, interactively discuss with you and try to answer your possible cases like this text. But it also provides email autoresponder, another product, or also the tool that can, uh, the call center agent can use to quickly look up 
and NSAF already known cases. So this kind of products all connected to central knowledge base. And it actually processed different types of uh, natural language sentences. So you know, that's the, our uh, you know, the uh, product side overview, top level overview. Internally then, what is the core task? Let's say when you do natural language understanding <laughs> in our context, what we are doing is actually this one. Is this given request text, request text like the one in the left side? That means this knowledge base case like this case. So it's basically what we are doing is textual inference or text to text comparison and decision. So here is a simple case that is actually working pretty well in our, uh, uh, you know, the, our models. So let, let's say I, uh, one of IT, typical IT company uh, text, I, I changed it to English from our customer. I bought your great video something something DVD, but you know, I want my money back. Then it's matching this case, I want refund. Maybe I, you will have some subsequent things you have to do. And then also it matches, I bought box version of the software and you want to refund it. But it shouldn't match like this third case because it's a, a special, uh, somewhat different cases with which will match this one, but not this one. So yeah, so this one is looking trivial, but not trivial. The, what I want to point out here is that this works already well, but it's not trivial. For example, money back, should the, the machine need to know, I want money, my money back means refund in e-commerce context. Also, it has to know DVD, I bought DVD means that it's a boxed version, it's not a downloaded version, and so on. So, so yeah, this is texture uh, comparison or texture inference. This is the, at the center of our, you know, the uh, engine. So by saying engines, uh, what I mean is that converting text into representation space and then compare two representations and then decide, are they meaning, uh, the meaning semantically equivalent or not, kind of dec deciding stuff. So internally, we keep multiple representations. Definitely, we need search engine because sometimes you just want to you know, answer back in real time some keyword search, like from expert agents, sure. And then our main model is actually, current generation main model is this part. The main study is done by shallow neural network model, which we train a word vector-based model plus composition model, combined together and trained in a joint model. So then it actually, what it learns that representation is a single vector, within the concept space. So conceptually, this uh, you know, request seems to be talking to the same topic of the you know, same one knowledge base or not is the decision point where we use similarity metric to decide it. Uh, recently added and currently loading out is a slightly deeper or bigger neural network model where we use transformers. So it's of course pre-trained transformers fine-tuned on the domain self and supervised and self-supervised tasks. The output is not a single vector, but a sequence of vectors, typical transformer output like BERT. And here we, we hold a full syntactic and semantic information of the text, just as a Professor Alexander Reza showed us that. And then uh, at the end of the day, the decision is done by a task layer, the last layer of the BERT or a typical transformer, where we also do the same things. As you can already, yeah, so this is the three, present, three different representations that we currently keep. And I want to share some insight or something we faced while we implementing this on our productive system. So I will, uh, yeah, I guess many of you already know the transformers, but let me briefly visit what are transformers and, and uh, yeah, since we are talking about transformers. So uh, Jack Lipton, uh, Professor Carnegie Mellon, actually uh, early this month posted this one. 2019 was the changing point. I totally agree which means that up until 2018, people were suggesting many different neural network models for vision, and for actually vision was uh, made earlier than uh, natural language processing, but also natural language processing and so on. So, and, and what we here, we as a research community now realize that we now have the models, that models that can do good functional approximation over the data. So previously we had models were too weak or we didn't have enough power even though you put enough data, something you couldn't reproduce was possible. Nowadays, general agreement is that if you have given, if you have enough, uh, uh, uh. if you have enough data, then probably the model will follow up the data, reproduce the, what the data is meaning about. So that's the, some kind of the agreement they are having. So in that sense, I agree. So, for natural language pro processing, it's uh, transformer models, this uh, 
everyone seems to be using it, you know, and it's uh, uh, like Google Bird, Facebook, XLM, OpenAI, GPT-2, mostly based on, you know, the same uh, self-attention mechanism. Let's just call it transformer model. Yeah, so it's actually hard to find research paper that is not using one or two transformer-based model. If you m implement the base model without transformer, everyone will say, why don't you, you know, implement a baseline based on transformer or BERT? So when transformers are now coming to productive systems uh, like ours, and then you might ask, actually the question I was asking six months is or last year, how good does it work for real world application? And what kind of pitfalls or problems you are facing when you try to bring it in the productive system? Yeah, we are now trying to rolling out some models in some products. So in this talk, I would like to share some lessons, uh, actually five lessons uh, we learned on the process. Lesson one, the first question you get when you say, oh, we are uh, rolling out the transformer models is actually, that's very slow, isn't it? Kind of yes, but kind of no, it's actually okay. So this is a joke from uh, Kyle Grove, a, a machine learning guy in Seattle. So his joke was that, you know, attention is all you need is the paper from Google 2017 that started all transformer things. And then he joked that then must be from the, you know, the, the Google Cloud team. This joke is uh, establishing because Facebook is actually paying and, you know, this amount of money just to train model for this paper. Actually, if you, if you use the same code base, Microsoft is also paying this money to Google Cloud. So that's quite funny, isn't it? But to be fair, to be fair, actually training any model with, you know, 100 millions of parameters needs to take computation time. So if someone says transformer training is too slow, Yes, but if you train any model that is too big, that's, the, that's bound to be taking that much time. And of course, you don't train something from scratch, mostly like you start with already pre-trained one and further pre-train or you know, just fine tune it, right? So of course training, if you are doing just fine tuning, depending on the model you choose, you, it can be done on a decent uh, GPU or TPU in just one day or something like that. So it's actually manageable. What's more critical is of course inference time. Inference time is what makes or breaks. Can we do inference on the CPU? Yes, it's the answer, to, but you might ask, can we just use GPU for inference? That is normally not possible. For example, even small uh, service company like us, we process several thousands of requests per minute of a hundred different customers, which means that you have to keep several, several dozen or at least 100 models, and that's on the GPU or TPU, it costs too much. So you have to be able to scale on CPU and big lens. By managing, scaling down, actually transformers are actually pretty good at scaling up or scaling down, you can actually achieve near real-time inferences. Of course, if you choose a big model, just uh, like you know, the biggest uh, bird, it, it can take simple question answering 20 seconds, but you can manage it down into less than single second. Then you can selectively activate the, the model when you need, you, when you have enough data or you have enough complexity you can still manage the real-time real inferences. So that's what we learned, and that's the first condition why we are now slowly able to pro uh, loading out the, the model. Uh, second, second lesson is quite interesting, quite interesting. So this is what I, what the term I use for why pre-trained transformers are working so well. So my way of, what I like to say is force multiplier. By force multiplier, what I mean is that when you push something with just one power of one, something is helping you. So it's working as if you are pushing the power with 10. So in that sense, force multiplier. So here, uh, what I want to say is that when the model is pre-trained and the pre-trained model, say some pre-trained model like BERT already know topical relatedness pretty well, paraphrasing and even simple reasoning. If you, in, in such a condition, and if you, on, if you try to generalize on those kind of things, like this is topic generalization, so you are just giving it one example. Any chance of raining is, means asking about weather. Or here, you are, you are giving, I want order the second copy of first book means how can I add prints after initial order. You are giving just one example, but it's generalizing as if you are having any additional, even some different, Exemplars are being fed into the data. So it's, it's the same case. So you, you are just giving one, but it actually generalizes pretty fast as if you are giving more data. One lesson we get is that 
not every kind of generalization works that way because transformers, most of the transformers are trained on a language modeling task and they generally don't know negations or presuppositions or some specific complex linguistic phenomenon. So here's an example. So I want to generalize, could not do something, cannot mean something is okay. Very easy and very simple, you know, fact, right? But generally, most, uh, you know, transformers trained on language models don't know how this don't have this generalization yet. So when you train this one, I could not install it correctly, cannot mean installation okay. It then answers correctly from here, but it still don't generalize over this. So you have to give more data. So once you have enough data given for this phenomenon, then it's follow up, then it generalizes. So yeah, if you draw the, the number of the data point and the accuracy on this generalization, it actually follows up much late. So takeaway point is that if your task require a phenomenon like negations or presuppositions, then you need to provide more data than other simpler things that the model already know. So that's the lesson two we learned. And the lesson three we learned is actually quite simple one is that, you know, if you, people say that this, this is a two-step process for using whatever NLP problem. Pick a decent enough pre-trained transformer, Bart, Bart, Roberta, Robert, whatever you like, and then fine tune it on your test data. So of course you have to select good model for your, your, your own domain. But what we find very shortly is that further train on your domain text with self-supervised task. By self-supervised task is of course the, the same one as you used from pre-trained. And for words, it's actually predicting masked word or predicting next sentence. This simple task that you can create from unlabeled row corpus. Doing that or not sometimes make great changes. This is one example for, you know, I, I use for the, this kind of information. So this is GUMI in different contexts. Of course, if you, German word for plastic, I guess, or lover, you know, kind of confusing, but. So GUMI means that, uh, GUMI, GUMI band, the plastic band, or in the uh, glass, brille, glass context of the, you know, this kind of glass context, people do use GUMI to point out this thing. This fact, this fact is very easily picked up. If you just train a, a few word vector training, it will be picked up. Like this GUMI can mean this one, or nose, nose pad, nasen pad, or even LSAT type, the replacement component, it picks up pretty easily. But even on web scale, this is not there yet. So you almost always get something from uh, your domain data. Of course, if your domain data is exactly the same data to already, I mean, step one data, then you don't need to do it. But mostly it is not. Mostly it is trained on the web scale data. You take benefit of, you know, domain training. So number four is something, something is very fascinating. I've been, uh, I actually looked up every paper I could find, why this works so well and how is, you know, so, so still something somewhat mysterious to me. So multilingual transformers are of great benefit. It works pretty, pretty well. So multilingual transformers are transformer models that are pre-trained on multiple languages and it has ability or believed to have ability to make multilingual or language neutral representation. So yeah, people have many different why it works, but let's, let's don't touch it. But the, this is pretty useful is what I want to say. Because in many cases there are, because as a, as a customer support company, we support our customers where they support you know, different languages. For example, a European software company and one of our customers, they have you know, many German data. If you consider German data as 100%, they also have a large amount of English data and some amount of Swedish data and some very rare amount of some even more exotic languages like Chinese. So in, in such a condition, disparity of data of a language, multilingual transformer performs really, really well. So the, the example that the visualizing analysts that I said as a force multiplier, it works even, even more in a, in a one degree differently. So here is an example. I want my money back and I put it that this should be guided to how to request a refund. Then it, is, it works as if I put also German version, you know, French version and some other Korean version and so on. It works as if you gave such a data. So some minor languages or data less languages like French, if that's the case, 
it will be also trained and behave better, even though you never, you didn't really provide that much data. Of course, there are pitfalls. Not all language pairs are equal. So if you train English, then French and German works actually pretty well. But Korean or Chinese generally don't pick up almost nothing. So this is very interesting, very interesting part. And also there are some vocab vocabulary size matters. So MBERT or multilingual BERT is the first multilingual model that is open to the general public. It has for some languages too few vocabulary size. It, would, it wouldn't work that well for that language. So you have to be careful using it. But you know, these multilingual transformers are pretty, I think many of the interesting things will come out of it. Uh, this is another, fi my uh, final uh, uh, lesson, this is another very interesting thing. So I couldn't find who said this one. I, I couldn't find means that I remember it wrongly probably. So, but th the meaning was something like this. I hear it from one of the uh, ICML conference. Your model will do anything, anything to optimize the loss function. It will ruthlessly do cheating or make shortcuts if you give it a half a chance. So what does he mean, or what does, do we mean by this cheating or making shortcut is that if your data, if, if your model scores very well on your data, then you have to be careful if it's real or if there was uh, some exposure in the data. So one of the paper written in last year, so I can give you some example later, but yeah. So there, they actually analyzed question answering data. So one question data, the, the data, question answering data set and try to trick it and then realize that, not by analyzing, but by try to tricking it, they realize that what it learned is something like this. If the question is asking a person name, answer with the second name of the last sentence. Then it was already scoring 85%, human rate is 90 percent something. So it was already pretty good. So it stopped and converged there and not improving anymore. So that's quite interesting. So, so that by that, uh, more practically it would say, we, it is possible unintended by us can be entering the system, especially if your data is small. So smaller data is easier to introduce such holes. But because as we, the most, one strong thing of the transformer is that because of the pre-training, you now can make small data to work better, right? Which means that it is also easier to introduce such holes. In our case, we used for some negative data population, I choose a long, pre-processing pre, pre uh, uh, because I wanted some, some faster one, then it actually treated the uh, uh, punctuations differently. The machine picked it up. So if punctuation looks different, this is probably a bad example. So you have to be very careful because you can't really say the model not to use punctuation or not to use just word alone or not to use the ordering because you, there's no way to introduce good bias or knowledge into the model. So you, everything you have to do is give by data. So the importance of the well designing training set, or in other words, data preparation, never changes. It's, it was always important, and it is still always important with the even more powerful models. So that's the fifth, uh, you know, uh, lesson that I get. Now, yeah, so let's try to visit what kind of improvement we had the, with BERT. Uh, just some examples that I've been analyzing with some, uh, some two tenants. One is IT company and one is the uh, photo printing company of uh, Germany. So, so uh, new model handles better on phrase or sentence structure as expected. It's, it's not surprising, but let's visit it. Our existing workhorse, which is word vector plus composition model, is pretty well, uh, working pretty well, but it only, you know, it, it works pretty well and picking up photo book means product. Baren kopin zu fügen, adding to the uh, cut means best talent, uh, ordering. However, if, if you give this data and even edit this on the training step, then it, 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 it fails to make this uh, connection because to really make that connection, you have this expression. Look, I identify, this misspelling is not from me, actually from the data itself. I identify 10, uh, photo booth then baren so it's no uh, once more second something to you know uh, cut adding is really ordering multiple item so this is praise level uh, you need praise level structure to generalize over the second example is also something similar so can I order la last photo book once again printed and uh, get it so get looked is 
easily trained in previous generation as the best talent. However, the last quarter book once more print is actually not best talent like repeat order was not able to be picked up in previous model, but now it's, uh, it can be picked up rather easily. Another related or similar uh, uh, issue we had in the IT test is like this one. So this is an, uh, a part of email. I have installed something, something, but I have error code 36. And he say, I am using Windows 10 and installation went without issue. Previous generation engine actually reported two cases. Okay, how can I report, how can I fix error code 36 as a, the uh, topic one? And you know, how can I fix installation issues for good music as topic two? So in previous generation engine, it's actually as concept space. It has windows, installation, and some issues. So for it actually looks even without, it looks like so many, so close to the windows installation issue of the good music. But with the uh, praise level information, it handles the nuance much better. So without issue, don't trigger that, you know, I have problem or I have error in the installation. So that kind of improvement, improvement we already have. And the cross lingual matching is another interesting thing. So we tested how, I've tested how it works, like how to unlock the, how, let's say this one. So how to unlock previously purchased downloads is quite somewhat asked question in, a, in English. But the, for, let's say, just like many, many other knowledge bases, this knowledge base is actually different scale. For English, we have a large number of the knowledge base cases, for German too, but not on Dutch system. Then the system can now report. Over the, over the last week, we had, we, it seems that very highly likely to matching, you know, Dutch request on this topic, but we couldn't serve it. So we, could do, we can do it better by adding this knowledge base in uh, a Dutch knowledge base. So this kind of comparison is something uh, we were not able to do previously, but now enabled by you know, multilingual models. We also, this kind of improvements we're seeing, because of that, we are now trying to rolling out our models into the more products. So conclusion, conclusion is that pre-trained transformers are now the model of NLP as of now. It is something can replace it in the future, I guess, because this is probably the first practical big model in my opinion. So it can handle almost all linguistic phenomena given that you have enough data. And also it, uh, it has naturally pre-training, works greatly, it works like a first multiplier. Also it's very nicely catch up with variety of natural language expressions. So there's no reason not to use transformers on your system. So that's, uh, that's quite for sure. So of course the, currently we are rolling out this representation in one queue. So it's, as I said, it's managed over a real time. It's never say it's easy. So we are now starting small on some tele selected uh, customers with some selected uh, applications. Once we get more competent, we will uh, replace our current engines in the, my boss hope to do this in the mid to 2020. Yeah, reality, we'll see. Yeah, so this is very interesting time. Very interesting time to be active in a small startup, tech startup. You know, I, I wrote my first distribution of semi sem semantics paper in 2007. So the changes, but changes in last three years, practical changes in the system level, not the paper or theoretical changes. Practical changes in last three years actually, you know, greater than 10 years before that. This is very interesting time. Fast-paced research progress with practical code and models. And even my postdoc days were 2012 to 2014, not that far away. Even back then, you know, codes were not there. The sharing code and model was not low standard, but they are now standard. That's kind of so, uh, yeah, so nice time to do a uh, tech startup, fast moving, following the, the, the tech, pl tech players. We expect even more powerful, clear, applicable methods and models to come. I have some idea, but I just don't have the, you know, papers, pages to, to say, so I, I just skipped it. So we aim to deliver latest progress in natural language uh, understanding research to the market with our product. That's our intention. Yeah, thank you. That's all.